All right, and next I have the pleasure of introducing Andrada Oltianu. She is, Andrada is a data scientist at, at, at Endava, a Z by HP Global Data Science Ambassador, a weights and bias dev expert, and a Kaggle Notebooks Grandmaster. So, Andrada, welcome to the stage. Okay. So this is going to be a little bit of a different cookie. I also hope I don't offend anybody in this presentation. Um, so this is a stove. <laughs> um, a few months ago, I got super into design. So I read The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. And out of many things, he was talking about stoves and how most of the people do not know which switch fires which burner. So even after five or, te or 10 years of, use of using the same stove in their home, they still don't know how, which switch is the correct one. So you end up being a fool and trying all of them until one works. And he was saying that this is not because people are stupid, it's because the design is bad. And this happens because we want to show a 2D object, right, the burners, with a 1D representation. So our brain cannot quickly find the correlation and the connection so we end up just being or looking dumb. Um, another example of bad design. So I will ask you not to read the text, not try to read the text. So uh, this I call the corporate slide. I think I see this slide all the time in presentations in the corporate world. I've been in two companies as of now, so maybe I don't have a big pool of examples, but uh, the, there are a few bad things here. So first of all, the text is like extremely small. So you, you cannot properly read it. There's also a lot of text coming at you once on the slide. So you end up thinking, well, I wanna read everything, but then you think, oh, I need to actually listen to the person that's talking, and in this case, it's me. But your brain can to do things at the same time. So you end up switching between the text, the person, and Twitter maybe, or any other thing that you're playing on your phone. So basically, out of this slide, you get nothing. And then there's half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour of presentation that's completely wasted. Uh, people also like to add arrows, I saw, although they don't actually showcase a process or an iterative anything. But they look cool, I, I, I know. But they, I, they are added just for fun. And another thing that's added for fun is usually some emoticons that have no correlation uh, with the text on, on the bottom. Um, so we have bad design in our appliances and in our day-to-day -day life. We have bad design in uh, slides, we have bad design in websites, and we also have bad design, turns out, in data and data visualization. So people uh, aren't taught in school how to read a graph. So I actually, after I, I finished high school, I went into college and I was like, okay, uh, I have no idea how to read this because I never saw one, right? And as we go, and we are data scientists and data experts, so now, of course, it looks simple to us, but it's not the case for many people. So um, when I was learning data science and I found out about it, I also discovered Hans Rosling, who is actually one of my heroes. Um, he died in 2017, but I found his TED Talks and he was incredible. And he was talking, like he founded Gapminder, and he was always saying, mind the gap. I think CPMP also said something like this today. This is a bit of a little gap, 
but uh, he was talking about the fact that people usually have a very biased or skewed view about all sorts of things in the world, like world hunger, um, uh, overpopulation, the um, uh, pollution of the seas and so on. And this is because we'll watch the news and the news are usually super biased and then we kind of, the word of mouth goes into place. So everything is super skewed. So his answer to closing the gap between what's actually happen happening and what we know is data, right? And we have a bunch of data that we have available in the world uh, but we also ha need to showcase it in such a way that is interesting and convenient and relatable to the audience that we are presenting. And again, I highly encourage you if you want to look at his TED Talks because he fascinated me of how through data visualization and just very simple examples where it was able to talk with a big audience of how many people and how many backgrounds. It was incredible. So why is this important? So why you might need design or to think about design because you're a data scientist, right? So a few examples. First example, I, um, uh, in my company, we work with a lot of clients. And these clients usually come up with a problem. So let's say yesterday's problem, build me a recommender system. So this is a business question which usually is super simple, right? I want a recommender system. This is the business, right? And then it's not actually that simple, right? We go deep. We are going, we are inviting data scientists, data engineers, ML ops, business analysts and so on. We are getting deep. We are doing the work and we are finding a solution, right? But then you cannot remain here. You need to go back up because, I don't know why it's doing this. And I lost it, but it's fine. Hello? Oh, it's fine, it's back. <laughs> so, um, we need to go back from the hardcore data science and relating back to the business. Talk like this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another example that you, why you might need to get into the business is to talk about the designer information design. And it's been going out there for one year. So he looked at it and the way it gets presented and the way it gets presented and the way it gets presented um, wasn't very good. So after that really time, he realized, oh, okay, this is not the way I, I need to work on it. Another example, he talked about the where they had this uh, ignition Hello? Okay. You might want to do a write-up, not a markdown, a write-up. And you are doing a write-up maybe because you want other people to kind of understand what you did. So there's also a place when you want to apply good design. 
uh, there are tools like MLOps, experiment tracking tools, where you still, although you are talking to data scientists, your dashboards and everything, those are people that are gonna use your tool and you still want to apply good design in this stuff. So there are a bunch of things that you need to consider whenever you think, well, for yourself, yeah, it's fine, you can do whatever, but whenever you are talking with an audience, it's a bit different. So we need good design and there are a bunch of issues. So uh, we usually have elements that are needed, which just drive me mad sometimes. Uh, unreadable information, which is just bad because you cannot get the point. You have boring displays, so you just don't, aren't really interested. And it, in the end, misses the point. So, um, this is why we need some principles, like we need our graphs to be attention grabbing, we want them to be easy to read, and finally, extremely important, accurate and clear. So uh, I'm not gonna say that in 30 minutes I'm gonna teach you how to be uh, information designers. This is a job in itself, <laughs> apparently. Um, but I will give you first some principles and then I will get into what I usually use and what I usually look, uh, look at before doing something uh, like this. So first of all, the form. These are just the basics. So you all know there are various types of charts. These are just a few of them that you can use and there's no good uh, approach. Like C was talking about like in ML, there's no model to rule them all. This is the case too. But there are also some principles, right? For example, if you wanna show alignment, you might, might wanna use a timeline or a bar to show the alignment of a few categories on a certain value. If you want to see repetition, you might want to use a multi-line uh, multi or just a line to show development in time. If you want to see symmetry, you might want to use a violin or a density plot to see um, similarities or differences between two, uh, two distributions. And if you want to see, see imbalance, you might want to use a bubble because for example, you have two products, one product has 90% of the sales. Of, there is a very, very imbalanced um, thing going on that you might need to consider. Corners. Um, I thought of not doing this, I, I, like I'm going to talk to data scientists about corners, but this is actually pretty important. So there are, for example, imagine a line chart, right? You can use sharp corners, this is important, trust me, uh, like peak of the mountains, right? Or round corners, which look like waves. Uh, at some point, I just naturally oriented, uh, gravitated towards round corners, and then I realized why. So apparently there's a very, very biological and natural explanation. So just an, as, a, as an experiment, try to look at the very Sharpie image with your eyes. And you might notice that it's a bit harder to look at than just the plain circle. This is because our eyes have developed over and over in time in such a way that because nature is very rounded, we read information much, much better, and there are studies that show that rounded information reads better in our brain than sharp. Uh, there is also a correlation between, for example, the claws of a lion, right? These are dangerous, we don't like it, they are spiky, whereas a ball is fine, although a bowling ball might be not the case, but you get the idea. So. I would use this in your advantage. Most of the people say, I, I read a bunch of articles and they say, oh, always round it. However, if you want to represent something that's broken or loud or just not in the right place, I would actually recommend using sharp to draw the attention very, very quickly. Okay, so uh, choosing the best form. Again, trial and error. I just want to take this out of the question. So first of all, 3D anything is the worst thing you can ever do, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never. Because it's, it's just bad, the gray part looks like it's bigger than the blue part, you get the idea, they are actually the same, just don't. However, the 2D 
it's still not as good, I would say, because for example, you cannot see clearly that the gray and the blue are actually the same value, how bigger is actually the red. There is also, it's hard to move your eyes from the actual label to the color. So just spending a couple more minutes on it. And I chose a bar chart where you can see, clearly see Jador, Joy by Dior, same sales, Miss Dior a bit better, and Dolce Vita very, very, very good sales. I worked in a cosmetics company as a data analyst for two years, and I also can safely state that managers like pictures because they sometimes can't remember their products. So adding these images is also very, very nice. And here you can explore going from more basic forms to a bit more evolved. Um, here, for example, you can also sometimes break the rules. Uh, I didn't add it here a legend because I would have cl cluttered the overall view, but you can also add interactivity, which is fun. And you can hover over some stuff here and then the label, I hope you can see there's a label here and some additional information uh, that can pop up, um, which is very, very nice. And again, forms can get fun. You can play around, here is a bar chart, but instead of a simple bar chart, it's rounded and stuff like that. And there are also some conventional forms that I'm going to be talk to, talking to you about in a second. Color theory. So, I'm not oblivious, I know you're scientists and you don't care about color. I do, but I'm a big outlier. But this is important, I'm, I'm gonna explain to you why and I'm not gonna bore you to, there, to death, hopefully. So, color uh, levels. This is important because, for example, if you wanna show uh, two, perfume, two, two perfumes together, you might want to use low contrast because it's still blue but there's a high, uh, lighter blue and a darker blue. So you're saying, well, it's something of a same thing, but it's slightly different. So perfumes, but different perfumes. You wanna use high contrast, contrast, like a light blue and a yellow, when you want to showcase that, oh, these are fundamentally different, like a perfume or a moisturizer. So that's a good rule to follow. Also, our brains love patterns because as, in the moment we identify a pattern, we use it to learn. And I think you know what I'm talking about. So using patterns in your advantage is also super important. So let's see a few, uh, couple examples. This is a graph from Bartosz, who I encourage you to look at, uh, to actually go, because this photo doesn't do it justice. It's actually super interactive and fun. It's amazing. So it shows, um, the top songs in the Spotify top charts and how many days he stay there. So he uses contrast, he uses high contrast. He uses orange for the songs that are still at this point in time on the list and gray for the things that drop out. He also uses a very interesting shape. So this, this is very, very different to showcase how many days the song in total stayed uh, in the top charts. Another example here, so this is my graph, but it's actually an idea that was completely stolen from somebody else, but I loved it in so many ways. So uh, this is a wheel, and uh, you can see here all the states in the United States, right? And we have four features. So in total, we have five features that we are looking at in the same time. So there is a pattern here, right? We have all the colors that are extremely saturated, represent values above 50%, and all the color, uh, colors that are very low in, con uh, in contrast and extremely pastel are values below 50%. So looking at this wheel, it's extremely nice that one person can look at five features and compare between states between these four features, between features and the states, and get the very, very high pictures by looking at just one graph, not five, not six, not one. Um, I prepared a video for you today, which maybe unfortunately for you, I cannot play. 
Um, but if you are very bad with color and you have no idea of how to choose color properly, you can come to me afterwards and I would be more than happy to show you how you can start from one color. I started from this one, a uh, very nice Kegel blue, uh, and develop an entire set of colors that always go together. So this was what this was about. Um, Greg Gunn, who's a designer and a website designer, uh, I uh, uh, watched him and I learned from him that also color balance is super important. So um, to keep the colors in a good balance, you need to have something like a 60% of one or two colors. Here is the green a 30% um, um, your base or just neutral colors, and then a 10% a very, very contrasty or light color for something that you really want to show. So here is an example. I used the green and shades of green. This is price distributions for Sephora. Um, so three distributions, I used my base 60%, um, my green, then for the background, I use my neutral and I also use black. And then if you notice, so the most expensive perfume was a Tom Ford. However, it was very interesting to me to see that there is actually a moisturizer that's even more expensive than a perfume, which I believe it's a Korean <laughs> moisturizer, SK2 Ultimate Revival Cream. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. I want to highlight that. So I use my 10%. Okay, so um, last step would be what I usually use. So, because this is, what I've been talking to you about is just the baselines, but I also, for anybody that's interested, I wanted to give you a go on what I use to actually create whenever I'm doing an analytics competition or a dashboard or I'm having fun. So I'm, I'm usually looking at nature, People are gonna tell you they are looking at movies or stuff like that, but people are the best you can ever learn from. So this is my first example. Uh, believe it or not, I didn't when I saw this. This is a visualization. Um, so it was done by Georgia Lupi, who's a data visualization expert, who was hired by Pentagram, who's a design company in USA, and she created this. And for the full legend, you can go on her site, you can see it, but I'm gonna walk you through just a little bit to get a grasp. So she analyzed this girl, 100 days uh, of this girl's uh, life. And this girl had a blood problem. So uh, this blood problem made her bruise, have very big and nasty bruises. She would bleed, she would have nausea, all the, all the good stuff. Um, so she visualized, visualized this uh, girl's life in or 100 days in this graph. So does the petals that you see here, each petal represents one day. Okay. The red dots that you see here uh, are bruises. So the number of bruises she got in certain periods of time. There are also some dots here that are kind of purplish, these are the nosebleeds. The yellow, just like sparks all around, are very joyful places that she had in her life. The black dots here and here, here, are I think visits to the doctor. I think, <laughs> I cannot remember actually. And all around, if you can look, there are words from her diary. So I think we can, agree that this is actually a data visualization. Okay, another one that I really, really liked and I wanted to show you was done by Federica Frapagane. She's an Italian. She's a data um, information designer, sorry. And she created this graph. Why I love this graph so much is because she used such an unconventional form. So this graph shows the noise pollution in different cities around the world. And she used this shape because um, it resembles, or at least in my brain, it resembles an eardrum. 
or it also might resemble a um, seashell. And I don't know if you ever put a seashell to your ear. It sounds like the sea. If you ever just, just try it, it's incredible. So just by looking at this form, I see noise or sound. So I know in an instance what I'm looking at. Uh, the size of the shape is how big is the noise. The color of the shape is if it's above or below average. So extremely, extremely simple. Lastly, for any economist or capitalist enthusiast, um, Visual Capitalist has an entire team of, uh, of data designers. And they put out incredible, incredible, extremely various uh, visualizations because everybody has a unique style. And uh, they have a bunch of inspiration. So anything you want to do, you can go there and you can steal bits and pieces and then adapt it to, to what you want to do. So here, for example, is just a frequency of people that you see on, on bills, like on money around the world. Monarchs, 30%, head of government, 20%. Scientists are around 1.21, so we don't have many chances uh, or high probabilities, let's say. So my final thoughts. I think we can agree that the impact that this visualization or let's say dashboard does versus this one is quite different. And I am extremely aware that the amount of work between these two is quite high. So I'm not gonna come to you and say, oh, this you can do in a heartbeat. However, depending on your audience or who you want to talk to or relate to, sometimes it's extremely important for us because this is what we do, we are using data, to be able to relate with other people to kind of share what we are doing to a broader audience or other data scientists, of course, tailored to what your audience is. So I believe it's quite good to have some basic design or just be mindful of this part whenever you are doing or wanting to share information and bring it into the world. Thank you. All right, we'll open it up to questions. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask the first question. So the first question, I would love to make beautiful visualizations that everyone understands, but the biggest challenge I have is knowing which tools to use. Um, how does one go about finding tools that are effective and not super complicated um, if all they know is matplotlib? Um, uh, two or three years ago, there was a girl that won the Kegel data science survey machine learning competition. <laughs> I think two or, no, three, three years ago. And she won by making this extremely impressive uh, heat maps and she used only matplotlib. And if you look at them, you don't think it's matplotlib because I looked at them and I was like, oh, what tool is she using? And she was using matplotlib. So actually matplotlib is extremely powerful. Uh, those designers that I showed you, um, apparently they use Adobe Illustrator, but this is like beyond data science. What I usually use is anywhere a combination between Matplotlib or uh, Seaborn and D3 when I want to get very fancy and nervous in the same time because it's, it's not that easy to use. Yeah. So core tools and know how to use them very well, mm -hmm. is that kind of the message? The thing is, you don't need to get extremely complicated. It depends on your audience. But it's, you don't have to get extremely complicated. If you know the fundamentals, you still can do something extremely rich and beautiful and clean without doing very fancy work. Thank you. All right, questions from the audience. Thank you for your presentation, and, and I also very enjoy your notebook on cargo. And uh, I just one question for, for you. So uh, when you do the visualization, the data, 
uh, we can add many information in, in a graph, for example, the size, the purple size, the color, or add some uh, 3D, some something. Uh, is there, an for, from your experience, is there an optimum number of information, maximum uh, information contained one, in one, one figure? Um, for example, the one from Georgia Lupi with the petals, it yeah. was quite a lot, right? Yeah. So you would say, oh, that's, that's mu too much, but she actually used a lot of negative space. What I usually use, if I, I'm not very sure what I'm doing is quite good, go to your mother, sister, brother, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, and show them and ask them, do you get it? Just no explain, do you get it? And if they don't get it, ask them why. Oh, this color is weird, or I don't, I don't get that arrow pointing, what's it pointing to, and I'll, I, okay. Because when you do it, it's extremely simple to be like, oh, it's, it's simple. But then when you get to somebody else, it's quite, it's quite a different opinion. So just asking anybody that's maybe resembled of your target audience, it would be fine. Thank you, it's a very direct uh, solution. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very, uh, I liked it a lot. And uh, so my question uh, for you is, uh, do you ever use uh, tools for generating like interactive figures? What do you think of, uh, so figures where you can interact with the numbers and show different things on the same figure? Uh, so what's your take on, on that, and do you ever use the, those tools? Like yeah. I think about Plotly or Bokeh, for example, if you know of them. Um, uh, they are, so I would say uh, they are most preferable because whenever you add a touch of the, of the user, like it's one way to look at something and then it's another way when you actually interact, you get a bit personal with whatever shown to you uh, and curious which is very very good so uh, d3 also uh, it's extremely interactive but it's a very tough learning curve like it took me three months and I I'm extremely beginner <laughs> after and I'm not uh, humble or anything like uh, it's hard because it's uh, JavaScript so I'm not used to it um, but the um, just if you want, check out that Bartosz uh, top charts wheel on observable, and you can play around and see how fun it is. You, you press a start button and then all the stuff appears, and then you can switch, and then you can also click on uh, the name or of the song, and it jumps into another uh, Spotify tab, and you can listen to Ed Sheeran in, in case you haven't heard his song or something. So it was extremely interactive, and it was done in, in, uh, in D3. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for the presentations. I have a question because uh, you were talking about Observable. I think Observable, like, it's the platform for data science in JavaScript, no? Yeah. What is your opinion about, like, um, uh, so there are, I heard there are mixed opinions. People say we should do everything in Python, and people say, like, uh, visualization and stuff should be in JavaScript, and modeling should be left in Python. What is your, your opin opinion on that? Um, I think they use JavaScript because um, the granularity, in JavaScript you can do, um, in D3 you can do spaceships. Like whatever you can think of at this moment, things popping up and going around and moving, like you have no limits whatsoever if you know how to code it, but you have no limits. Whereas in Python, you are pretty limited. Um, that being said, I uh, am a fond user of Python and I still hate JavaScript. So I don't know what to answer you. The granularity level is extremely nice, but yeah. Thank you. All right, other questions for our speaker? 
If not, let's thank uh, Andrada for a wonderful presentation.